Ryan Schultz here from E39 Source, and today we've got a DIY on a 2006 BMW E60 M5. We're going to be doing idle actuators as well as throttle body actuators. These are very common issues on this engine, in addition to many other common issues on this engine. Uh, the throttle bodies are, or throttle body actuators rather, are more so a common issue. Uh, we've already done them once at 65,000 miles. We had them done, I should say. Now we're doing them again now at 121,000 miles. They're actually not the problem. The problem right now in the DME, um, it's presenting itself as a DSC error, but it's actually an idle control valve error. So there's, uh, so there's two. There's an idle actuator on both cylinder banks. They're the same part, just quantity two. And then, of course, there are throttle, throttle body actuators as well, one on each cylinder bank. They're the same part, same part number, quantity two. We'll talk more about parts later when they show up. Today, we're doing the teardown and um, kind of everything that we've done, my partner here has actually done, um, I've filmed before. If you can't get to this point, having the upper air boxes off and the cabin boxes and cowling, you probably shouldn't attempt to work too far into the valley of the S85 here. In short, you're going to need a series of flathead screwdrivers, 10 millimeter and 13 millimeter sockets. There's a little piece in the middle that slides to the left or right to get the cowling apart. Then you do also have some Torx 20 bolts that hold in the cabin boxes to the strut tower right there in that hole and matching on the passenger side of the vehicle. There's two electrical connections on the passenger side, one for the AUC sensor and one for the hood switch. Real simple type, you just squeeze that tab and pull them off of the sensor and then leave the wiring hang. And the cowling looks like this. And these little plastic things are 13s and they only turn about a quarter turn loosen and then a quarter turn tighten. And it's got this little pivot swing arm here that just slides under and locks them into place. So you have one that connects the two pieces together, two here after you release the, uh, the clip here and, and the cabin filter, the third back there, and then it's the same on the passenger side. Regarding the air boxes, there's a series of clips around the perimeter. I believe there's five on each one, so you will need a flathead screwdriver to pop those out. The mass airflow sensors disconnect, and then we just have standard six millimeter or flathead screw hose clamps holding the um, ductwork here onto the intake plenum. We will also need to remove the covers over the ionic modules here. There's just two 10 millimeter bolts that hold each one in and they will lift right off. That's real simple. We're also gonna need to relocate our coolant expansion tank over here. It's simply held in with two 10 millimeter bolts, that hole and that hole, and then loosen that up, lift it up. As you lift it up, if you want some more room, you can wiggle off this connector here, which is your fluid level sensor. Um, otherwise, I think we're gonna be okay just leaving that sit right there. It doesn't leak or anything. Regarding the actual plenum itself, this thing's a real pain to remove, uh, but it's not impossible. So when you get to this point, there's a total of five hose clamps, one per cylinder on each bank that hold the intake plenum in place. Here in the front, there's a little rubber connector that just pops off the bottom that holds the two pieces of the plenum together. And then in the back, we have several hose clamps that will need to be undone. Uh, the one goes right here, and you just use some channel locks to pinch. It's like an old school connector. I'll show you in a moment. You just pinch the things together and wiggle it off. Then I actually popped it off of the cylinder head as well, and it's behind that hose, but it goes onto that big open uh, pipe right there. So uh, I found it was easiest to remove it from here first and then rotate it and then remove it from the cylinder head, and that is this piece. So this is the clamp I'm talking about. Just use channel locks, pinch that together, and it'll pull right off the plenum. Then these connectors, these are pretty simple to use. You find the open parts like that, squeeze them together, that pushes the tabs apart, and then you pull the hose off. When you've got that one out of the way, you've got the annoying smaller hose right here, and it uses one of those Oedeker clamps to attach to the plenum, so it's not gonna be easy to remove from the plenum. You wanna remove it from the cylinder head. And it's the same type of deal as the one I just showed you, where you squeeze the sides uh, right here. It's just very challenging to get down there and, and do it. And I, I found that um, tools don't really work or fit very well. So you're best to kind of lift the plenum up a little bit. And then that will allow the pinch points to rotate so you can get in there and actually squeeze those together and pull off. Now the hose clamps that hold the intake plenum on are really only accessible in one way. And each one is different. You can get down here, wear a headlight or get your phone light and you will see that they're standard hose clamps. They only fit one way and they're only able to be used one way, as I said. So uh, you can use a long flat head screwdriver or I actually find it a little bit easier to use a socket. This is a six millimeter socket. It is quarter drive on two six inch extensions on a small ratchet. 
And uh, that's a little bit easier to get onto the hose clamp without worrying about it sliding off. So some of them, in fact, cylinder, I think it'll be cylinder number two. You can just see the hose clamp hiding in there. It's horrible. Let me try to orient the light a little bit better. There it is. You can just see it back there. The camera doesn't want to focus on it, but there is the hose clamp. So I actually put the tool through this hole. This is an engine hoist lift point hole. So feed the tool through there, then you can just get it on there and loosen it. Cylinder one isn't bad, cylinder two isn't bad. Cylinder three, you've got to come in from the side. There's a bit of a cutout. Four and five back here are a real pain. I think we actually need, I will need to shorten the extensions on the tool and come in from the back, back behind these. Uh, this is the DME wiring harness here. So there is a way to get each one, just loosen it about three turns, get the hoses disconnected and then pull up. The plenum will come off. In fact, this one might be ready to go. Um, also important to note, there's another hose pier in the front. It's the same deal. You pinch the sides and wiggle it off of that pipe right there. And you can see the actual throttle bodies and here's all these hose clamps on the intake plenum. On the back of the passenger side, we have the wiring harness that pops into the plenum. It simply will lift up. It has a post or two in the bottom, like a peg that pushes down into a uh, bit of an acceptor, a, a, a hole on the plenum. So we'll wanna lift that up, push it back and out of the way before removing um, bank one. Lastly, all the way at the back, we have two more small hose clamps. This one appears to have been broken before. Um, we can see bank one right here. So again, we'll just squeeze the top and bottom, pinch and pull them off. The most difficult part here is on cylinder bank number one, all the way in the back, we've got to remove that hose and this hose. This hose is the hardest one. It helps to get that one out of the way. It helps to take the beauty cover off here for the plugs and coils. And then you pretty much just need to make sure you've got all five of these done. These last two, you kind of come in from the sides uh, you need a short extension on cylinder five and a longer extension. I used a 12 inch extension on cylinder four. Then you can lift the plenum kind of up and out of the way, buy yourself a bit more room to get back here. Try to squeeze those two things together and pry it off. It just sucks and it takes forever. With that done now, we can see throttle body actuators and idle actuators in here. We are gonna need to kind of relocate this wiring harness and disconnect a whole bunch of stuff to move it up and out of the way seeing that all four of these actuators are down in the valley. So the wiring harness has to all but be removed from the valley of this engine to access the four actuators down there. Uh, there are multiple connections, one on each throttle actuator, one on each idle actuator. We have two up here in the front. You just pry these tabs up and pull the connectors out. These are the same connector. So put some tape on one and label it as the right one or the left one, however you wanna do that. There's one on the left, so you don't really need to label that. The ionic modules have the uh, normal BMW connector here where you slide this whole locking tab out and then pull it up and off of the module. We'll do the same thing over here on bank two. Then you're gonna find a bevy of connections in there. Uh, anything that plugs in, unplug it, they're all different. There's a couple, like uh, there's a temp sensor down here on the cylinder head that uh, like an E39, it just has the, the springy metal tab. You squeeze it and pull the connector off. Uh, there's a bunch that just look like this and then have the little tabs on the side. You squeeze them together and pull them apart. All of these plastics are going to be incredibly brittle because they're living inside the V on a V10 engine that probably has miles on it um, at this point. So just be careful. Um, if you do break a couple little plastic things, it's probably going to be okay. Just make sure everything goes back together well. These connections will be sensitive to vibrations or coming undone if, uh, if not tight. The wiring harness box itself is attached in two places. We have a bolt here in the front that attaches to the thermostat housing. Uh, so we're going to want to take that out. I believe that was a 10 millimeter bolt. And then in the back, there's another 10 millimeter fastener. This time it's a nut and it's located right about here. I would use quarter drive tools. It's difficult to get in there. It's very short. You, you will need a three inch extension and a 10 millimeter socket. Um, if you don't put anything sticky in the socket, you're going to loosen the nut, then you're going to take the tool away and the nut's going to fall back down into no man's land. And you do not want that happening. So actually what we did was use a small piece of clay bar, like detailing clay bar and put that in the socket and then put it down over the nut and, uh, and loosened it. And that way the nut stays in the socket when you take it off. If you don't have any clay bar, hell, a piece of little piece of chewing gum would work or a piece of shop towel, anything kind of sticky and like clay or Play-Doh. A quick note on which nut back here for the back of the wiring harness. So if we stick the phone back here in the middle and look down, 
we see that one. That is not the correct nut. We move to the left towards the passenger side of the car, and it's that one. So just keep an eye on this wiring harness. Anything that, anything that uh, you see is holding it back from being lifted up like this. Anything that's plugged in, unplug it. We're not gonna be able to remove the entire thing, seeing that, of course, it is part of this box and then this hose that goes into the DME box, and we really don't wanna tear all that apart. So at this point, we're not. Uh, the rest of the wiring harness, of course, connects to each fuel injector. So there's 10 of those. Each coil pack, there's another 10 of those. Cam sensors, there's two on each bank. Um, and again, all of this is very, very brittle. So I fear we're going to have to be, it's going to be at least a two-man operation. Somebody's going to have to hold this up and out of the way while we work down there. So these two things in the front are the throttle actuators. So over 3,000 RPM, the throttle actuators take over and actually open these butterfly valves to allow air into the cylinders. Uh, below 3,000 RPM, it's your idle actuators that are doing the majority of that work, and they're in the back. Uh, that's the problem on this car, is the idle actuator on bank one. It's intermittent, as I think I mentioned before, it throws a DSC fault, but then it goes into limp mode, you make no power, 5,000 RPM red line, throttle's not sharp anymore, it's miserable. Uh, this engine loves to shut itself down at the first sign of any trouble. So let's take a look at the parts. They just arrived, I've got them all laid out over here. We're going to replace the hoses. These two hoses, this one is a short one, and then we've got a longer one. I'll have all the part numbers in the description below this video. Those two hoses are these. They snap into the wiring harness here, and then they attached, as you will recall, on the bottom of the intake plenum, one for bank two and one for bank one. And these actually go back to the idle actuators themselves. Uh, it's good practice to replace those. Uh, we got to look in here with a light, and there is some cracking in the rubber. Uh, they're simply held on with a normal hose clamp down there, so that's nice. So we'll just take those off first, and your short one is bank two, obviously. It's just going to here. Uh, so we've got those two hoses and the hose clamps that attach them to the idle actuators. And we've got these profile gaskets that will go on the idle actuators themselves. Those three holes on the perimeter there will match up with those three holes. I ordered four, thinking that these would use them too, although I don't see anywhere where there would be that sort of a gasket here. So maybe we only need two. Uh, again, check the description to be sure. And then, of course, your two throttle actuators and your two idle actuators. Again, all part numbers down below. And these are nice and fresh. It looks like the build date here is uh, be November 5th of 2018, so they're just two years old. Uh, they've been in a box since then. There are some aftermarket alternatives to these things. So the actuators themselves electronically seem to be pretty stable. The linkage itself seems to be fairly stable. It's the gears inside that drive them are plastic. BMW decided they wanted to save a couple of pennies by using plastic gears. And uh, over time, those get hot, they get brittle, they strip, you might lose a tooth. Um, and, and that's what the failure is with these things. Now, you could probably machine an aluminum gear or something like that and rebuild them yourself um, or just replace them and buy yourself another 65,000 miles before they will inevitably fail from the same cause. On the bottom of your plenums, both pieces, I'm trying to pick this up with one hand, um, you have these five little rubber boots that seat down over each uh, throttle body there. And if they are not put on right, this happens. It gets deformed, it gets caught, and it gets pinched, and it does not create a good seal. This could cause vacuum problems, get debris in that cylinder. It's just not good. That cylinder's not breathing well. So if you have any that look like that, absolutely replace them. I'll uh, leave the part number down there for that as well. So we've already ordered one of those. We're going to reuse this hose clamp on top. And then the hose clamp that attaches the rubber part to the plenum itself is one of these Odeker clamps. They are not reusable. You will need to replace that as well. Part number down below. Next thing we're going to do is detach the um, throttle actuator linkage from the throttle bodies themselves. Uh, we can easily see where those are. It uses this rod here to push those throttle bodies or pull those throttle bodies rather right? open like that. Um, we're also going to want to lubricate some of this. We shouldn't be hearing too many squeaks. If this joint here is real stiff, um, you're just causing your, your actuators to work harder to open and close those throttles and putting more stress on those gears that we already know are a weak point in the design. So we probably want to put a little bit of grease in this assembly before we put it back together. And then the same one over here. And they're not held on with anything but friction. So we'll just carefully put a flathead screwdriver in there and twist it. And this linkage should pop right off. Just like that. Try to get a look in here now at the three 10 millimeter bolts that hold the actual throttle assemblies, throttle actuators into the car. So we can see one right there. That is uh, one of the 10 mils. There's going to be a total of three. We can actually see all three of them there in a triangle formation. Uh, so we'll loosen those and we've already got it unplugged and then we'll just wrestle this out of the car. 
and replace them. So we need to remove both throttle actuators to get to the idle actuators, as I've said. So I'm gonna go ahead and get a 10 millimeter and pull those things out of here. Pulling the throttle actuators out isn't too bad at all. Three 10 millimeter nuts or bolts, excuse me, and then they just lift right up and out. There's no gaskets or other hose clamps, any of that. So the only four things holding them in there are the three 10 millimeter bolts, one electrical connection, and then this is where it attached um, up onto the throttles themselves on that linkage. Now, you could replace this arm. I don't really see a reason for it, so we're just gonna pop it off down here, install it on the new one, probably put a touch of grease in there just so it's a lubricated contact area and move those over to the new motors. With those out of the way, um, well, for now, we're using a piece of coat hanger to just hold this wiring harness up out of the way. I do not know if that's gonna be enough or not to get to the idle actuators. Idle actuators, the first thing we did was remove the two hoses that came up through here, and those are simple hose clamps. You can use a flathead screwdriver, or I prefer to use a six millimeter uh, socket on the end of a gun or a ratchet. We got those out of the way. Step two will be five millimeter hose clamps on top. So we've got one here, and the other one is over here, and we're not going to replace these hoses or whatever the heck they go into there. So we're gonna be very careful with these. We've loosened the hose clamps. We're gonna make sure the hose clamps come up and out of the way and then pull those hoses off both idle actuators. Okay, maybe 30 minutes, we have both idle actuators out and we're looking into the valley now where we found a lot of debris. Apparently this heat shield here likes to disintegrate and fall down in there. So uh, take a moment with the vacuum and clean all that out. Anyways, we have a couple attachment points on the idle actuators themselves. We firstly talked about these hoses. These were, uh, for some reason, bank two was a lot more challenging than bank one to get off. Uh, we pretty much just used some needle nose and gently kind of broke that friction coefficient by twisting the hose back and forth on the nipple and then just pull it straight up with the help of a screwdriver prying it off the bottom. The hose clamps are five millimeters. The other ones we talked about were six, so we just loosened the hose clamps, pushed them back here so we don't lose them, and disconnected both hoses. Then you've got a total of three 10 millimeter nuts on each one that go on each one of those studs. These two here are the most challenging ones to remove. This one isn't bad, and uh, really all of bank two isn't bad. So for bank one, you want to work over here on the driver's side of the car. For bank two, you wanna work over here on the passenger side of the car. You just have better access to those. Now, there are these things called ribbons, and these fit over the, uh, actually in between the idle actuators and the nuts. I'm not quite sure why it's there, but it is there, so we'll put it back on the new one. It's only gonna fit one way, seeing that it's got a specific three bolt pattern, and both of these are the same between banks one and two, so just reuse those. Now we also had the profile gaskets we talked about before. I don't know why I ordered four, we only need two. They're only on the idle actuators, and these gaskets are simply there to prevent the idle act actuators from welding themselves to the cylinder heads. These are not designed to create an airtight seal. The airtight seal, and I'll show you on the old idle actuator here, comes from this O-ring that fits down into the hole. So we don't need to go crazy with replacing I mean, you should replace these gaskets. These are like a dollar or something. So replace the gasket, but it, you don't have to worry about it being perfect. I did use some brake clean to clean out the bore. The bore is that hole, so clean that out since that's gonna be a sealing surface. And then also use some brake clean around the perimeter of that bore, the flat mating surface there, um, just to get it clean, but it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to go crazy with that. So I think um, we removed bank two first and bank one last. So I think we're gonna install bank one and then put in bank two. Idle actuators are in. So the O-rings that go on the pipes that go into the um, cylinder heads should be lubricated just a touch with some sort of a, we used a silicone-based lubricant just so they slide in their bore a little bit more easily without compromising the O-rings. Uh, so we pushed them in there. Don't forget the little black metal spring ribbon things that go on there. They only fit one way. We had new nuts, put those on torque to 10 Newton meters or 88.5. I rounded up to 90 or to 89, excuse me, um, inch pounds on those nuts. Then you just take your hoses, put the hoses back on top and tighten down the five millimeter hose clamps. Uh, the electrical connectors here, just make sure they're free and not pinched anywhere. We'll, we will be connecting those later. We're ready to move on now to the Throttle actuators, I don't recall uh, there being an important order of operations here, and they both are the same part, uh, keeping in mind that the bank one throttle actuator has an electrical connector that faces the firewall, plugs in from the firewall. Bank two has one that faces us and plugs in, pushing towards the firewall. 
Throttle actuator replacement here is actually pretty simple. With the engine harness up and out of the way like this, we have not had to move it. You know, maybe one, one of the other guys here has just lifted it up and out of the way or to the left or right, but we have not had to completely disconnect everything and fold it out of the way, as some of the DIYs are stating. Um, we have three more 10 millimeter bolts like we uh, took out, obviously, holding those throttle actuators in. We can see three of them right there. I also went down to 10 newton meters or 89 inch pounds on those bolts as well. Uh, I'm talking about the orientation that I think I did in the last clip. It faces that way. And we put a little bit of grease on the ball on the actuator and the ball on the um, throttle bodies here. And then these arms just pop on. Takes a little bit more force than you think, but they click into place, attaching that linkage. Nextly, we're going to reinstall these, uh, actually installed new hoses back here on the idle actuators. We took them off before. One will go here. The other one will go here. The longer one goes on bank one, the shorter one on bank two. Quick look at the hoses. I oriented the hose clamp over here on bank two to face the back. Uh, drove it with a six millimeter socket. It goes right into place on bank one. Passenger side, um, it's a little bit easier as it is right there facing us. Up next, you've got to plug in everything that we uh, detached before. So I'm not going to name everything, but do make sure you get the 17 millimeter back there. If you have a way to torque that, it's 25 uh, Newton meters, which is about 18 and a half foot pounds. We couldn't torque it, so we went by feel with a uh, with an open end wrench, which should be fine. Uh, we did break quite a few plastics, nothing terribly important, but how these things are supposed to snap onto the main box here sheared off, so we just use zip ties to hold them in place. Um, this one is still loose, so you can see how the plastics just disintegrate there, so it's not going anywhere. That will be fine. That we're definitely going to have to repair, so we'll get to that. Um, you also want to plug these things back in, your starter motor at the bottom, the temperature switch over here. Um, then there's one down there that gets plugged in. We had these two on the right, one on the left. This thing and that cable go back together. That's the same thing, 17 millimeter nut, 25 newton meters, 18 and a half foot pounds. Put the ionic covers back on. Those are gonna go down to 10 newton meters, 89 inch pounds. Same on both sides. This is also 10 newton meters. And then that stubborn nut in the back is 10 newton meters as well. So with all of that back together, um, really, we can't put the plenums back on right now because we need to get one more of those rubber seals that I showed you before. That'll be here on Monday, today's Friday, and then we've got to figure out that hose. Otherwise, the plenum, um, you want to make sure that all of those are lined up square over the throttle bodies before you press it down into place and then go through and tighten your hose clamps, make your connections at the back, make your connections at the front, connections on the side and the cylinder head, all of that. Uh, and then it's just total reverse of putting the cabin air boxes back in the expansion tank, the engine air filter boxes. Um, two notes, when you put the engine air boxes back in, make sure you rescue this first, move it out here out of the way. If you put it in there, it'll get stuck and then you won't be able to plug your math in. Ask me how I know I've made that mistake too many times. A similar mistake can be made with the idle actuators. The electrical connections for the idle actuators should be pulled up and made accessible before you put the throttle body actuators in. Once the throttle actuators are in, um, you lose a lot of space down in that valley. And uh, if you do what we did and forget to free those uh, idle actuator plugs, then it's just kind of a pain. And you gotta fish them out and you gotta be careful with them because they're new and they're expensive. So just make sure you pull them up and out of the way. Otherwise, I'll level with you guys. The throttle actuators and the idle actuators, just replacing them themselves, not a problem at all. It's easy, the throttle actuators are easy. It's just getting to them that's such a pain in the rear, mostly because all these plastics are really brittle and taking the plenum off is a pain in the you know what. And these air boxes are super tight and the clips keep falling down in there. It's just all the fiddly stuff of getting to them that's a major pain. Once you get access to them, it's no problem at all. Plenum reinstallation. I don't think it matters if you go left or right side, bank one or bank two first. Uh, whatever one you do first will be the easiest because you're able to look down here and actually see where those hose clamps go around the throttle bodies. And what you wanna do, uh, I kinda showed you before, you do not want to pinch that rubber and then have an open part here sucking in air from your hot valley. Um, that's not ideal, so just be careful, get it lined up. Uh, one thing to do when guiding it in here is make sure that the smaller hose, not the big one, but the small one goes underneath this, and then it's just gonna press back press right back on into place. You can remember how long that thing took to take off. Um, putting it back on is about a quarter of a second. You line it up and pop it into place. Same thing back there. Uh, with these hose clamps, I replaced the bad one. 
replace the connector on the one that was damaged and it just pops back into place. So two hoses on the side, one on the back, the one, don't forget about the one in the front underneath. It'll be this one that's ideally supposed to be popped in right there to the wiring harness. And then get your six mil and your extension, go in there and tighten down all those hose clamps. If you use a wrench, it's uh, it's easy to over torque those, so don't go crazy. Remember, usually people torque those with a screwdriver and you have a lot less leverage. All right, guys, we're back together. The rest of this here is pretty straightforward. Uh, the first half of the plenum doesn't matter which one you do. I did bank two. That's going to be a bit easier, as I said before, since we can see those hoses. Uh, it's not the case over here, and the angle's a little bit different when you put that second piece of the plenum back on. We did use a little bit of a lithium grease just to put some lubricant um, on the bottom of the plenum on each of the five rubber seals that goes down over each throttle body. And I think that kind of helps um, seat it on there so it doesn't kink or get caught. If you really have to use a lot of force to press the plenum down, um, it, it's not right and you're going to end up bending or kinking or damaging one of those rubber boots. So uh, it should go on fairly easily. And then it's just a matter of putting everything back together. Uh, same way it comes apart. Don't forget to keep your math wires up out of the way uh, before you put the air box, the lower air boxes back in. Otherwise, they will get caught. According to the BMW TIS, there is a uh, procedure that must be carried out after installing new throttle and idle actuators to uh, initiate them. That is not the case. We did not do that, and the car's been driven about 200 miles since then, and it's working just fine. No more codes, no more problems. As I said earlier in the DIY, um, the, the hard part is just... Really, the worst part is fighting with the air boxes and the expansion reservoir and then the plenum hose clamps. And these two back here uh, with the cowling off, you're coming in kind of blind from the side. You actually can't see one of them. You've got to go by feel. That's the fiddly stuff. Doing the idle actuators and throttle actuators themselves are not bad at all. Okay, be sure to check out the description below this video for a link to buy these parts for the part numbers as well as any applicable torque specs. Okay, that's going to do it. That's the end of the throttle actuator and idle control actuator on the S85 V10, of course, applicable to the E60 M5 and E63 and E64 M6 2006 through 2010. Thank you for watching this one. I'll talk to you guys in a future E39 source video. Stay healthy.